Margaret is going to talk to us about a new paradigm for assessing video quality in broadcast workflows. Okay, so I work for the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences. We're part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and um, as Brad said, I'm going to be talking about a new paradigm for assessing video quality in broadcast workflows. So the high level picture of the problem I'm addressing is a way to have a broadcast system automatically detect the quality of a video and give that information to the company who's streaming that video so they can do problem solving on it. So this is one that I see occasionally. I'm watching something that's supposed to be a progressive stream. Somehow the video is interlaced and nobody's caught it. So there's quite a few points where such an algorithm could be used. And this diagram here was given to me by some colleagues who work in broadcast saying, here's the points they would like to deploy this algorithm. For instance, on the incoming source input, or the incoming content from a third party to look for problems with the camera configuration. So they can say, oh, you misconfigured this, go ahead and fix it, uh, especially with real-time workflows, but also the encoder output, the transcoder output, and so on. The last point being the output of the player right before the client's monitor. And what they pointed out with these is it isn't really overall quality that's of interest, but rather, a detection of what problems they are. They said, okay, the managers want to know for the, the overall quality, but the people using and responsible for these systems need to know what problems are happening so they can fix them. YouTube spoke to our group at the Video Quality Experts group, and they pointed out they are uploading millions of user-generated content each day. The media format is inconsistent and unpredictable, and they don't know what sort of device it's going to be played on completely arbitrary. So compression is critical and the quality of these videos can be very low. So they'd like to be able to assess the quality with something we're calling a no reference metric to give information to the transcoder on what decisions it should make, how to best do that transcoding, but also apply it after the transcoder and maybe change what the transcoder is doing to adjust. But it could also be add a, a filter in response to this quality assessment. And Margaret, can you just briefly explain the difference between a metric where you've got a reference and one where you don't? Sure. So if you have a reference, if you know what the video is supposed to look like, then this is a much easier problem to solve because you can say the video was supposed to look like this and any deviations from that are a problem. The situation that we're talking about here, you don't have a reference. You don't have a clue what the video is supposed to be looking like. And so you have to model everything in the human visual system, your brain, your perception, um, and all of what's troubling you with the video. Yeah, and I think that one of the things for, for those of us that have heard you speak in the past, and also, of course, our dear colleague, Pierre Costa, there was a, a big focus on non-reference metrics to detect, especially detect problems that were uh, generated by com issues with compression or whatever in the, the transmission chain. And of course, um, the reason that we were interested in adopting no reference metrics is because it wasn't always possible to take a chain off air, stick a test card or put a, put a reference signal into a piece of uh, equipment and then measure what came out the other end. So I think from our industry perspective, our interest in, in non-reference or no reference metrics had been to be able to test equipment in flight. But here you're talking about an, another case where it's basically impossible to, to put in a, a reference and that's at, at the image imaging device, right? For, so this particular work is focused around around cameras where a, a reference measurement wouldn't even, even be appropriate, right? Yes, but there's also a lot of cases I've been told where the work electronic workflow is divided in such a way there just isn't a realistic way to get that reference. You know it exists out there, somebody had it, but when you need to make this measurement, you just can't get your hands on it. 
And realistically, any sort of a metric that needs that reference, you can only usually deploy in the lab. That, okay, it's theoretically out there, but that's what everybody I talk to in industry says, come on, it's a pipe dream. We just haven't built that into our system. So basically you're talking about devising some sort of algorithms that can act like a human and say, I don't like the way that looks. And then maybe think more and say, I don't like the way that looks because the cameraman panned the camera too quickly and it's blurry or, or whatever, right? Yeah. That sounds like a pretty, pretty tall order. It is. And that's exactly the challenge to look at it, to take the place of a person. I've been told that in some countries, broadcasters literally hire people to watch every single channel in, in real time, all the time it's operating. And then they trigger, oh, I see a problem. Something's happened. Go fix it. And, you know, given how many channels there are out there, I'm just really amazed that it's viable to take that solution. But that's what I'm told some people do. So this, the goal is to replace that living person watching every channel with some sort of an algorithm that could make the same detections and be consistent in what it detects. So there's a couple other places it would be useful. And one is in computer vision. So here the options are much more diverse. So you might want to have a real-time feedback loop to change what the camera's doing. Focus on an object, zoom into an object, change the exposure, increase or decrease the bit rate. Something to help the computer vision algorithm work better because this metric has said, oh, there's a problem with the quality. But it could also predict the success or failure rate of computer vision and say, okay, you're just never going to succeed on this part of the video. There's something so wrong with the quality, it's hopeless. Uh, either don't try or don't trust your results. But it could also say change between several algorithms. Maybe we have one that works well on high quality video, bright sunny day, and another is a better choice when there's a lot of noise or on a rainy day, for instance. And there's also other communities who may have very different definitions of what good quality is. And one community I'm working with is first responders. So they're trying to photograph or film transient events in very difficult environments. Uh, it's dark, there's insufficient lighting, uh, their cameras are moving, uh, a lot of mud splatter onto the lens. And they're per wanting to perform specific tasks and they want to make sure the video is good enough for those tasks. So there may be differences between what they want and what a broadcaster wants. And they'd like the camera to understand those differences and say, oh, um, fix that problem, change it to my requirements, but also give them a clue. You took a picture, it's going to be too low quality, take another picture now while you have the chance before your evidence scene is gone. So let's look at how to assess video quality and the metric that I'm trying to develop. So the gold standard for assessing video quality is a video quality subjective test or an image quality subjective test. You very carefully gather a set of images or videos to explore the question that you're interested in, which could, for instance, be to pick the proper bit rate for a, uh, a satellite system to be the right compromise between quality and the number of channels that you can fit. You randomize those short videos or images, show them to a panel of people who rate them on a simple scale. The most popular today is excellent, good, fair, poor, bad. Then we take those assigned numbers, average them, and call that a mean opinion score. This is, of course, very slow, time-consuming, expensive, and not practical for in-service problems. But it does give you your base of what a, a human would say is good or bad in a, in a statistically important way, right? Exactly. And you can do statistical tests to say not only is system A better than system B, but it's better enough that it's a statistically significant difference and not just little random variations based on the pool of people you chose to take your test. So we have good solutions for some type of metrics today. If you're looking at the performance of the network, we've got good metrics, including if you're looking at the video in the network and assessing the quality based on your understanding of what bit rate and what transmission errors are, what impact that's going to have on the video at that point in the network. 
We also have good comparisons metrics, like full reference metrics compare the high quality original from the camera with a compressed version. It may or may not have transmission problems. We have solutions there. What we don't have is any sort of a metric that can understand and assess problems coming from the camera and problems coming from the camera operator. So the example that Brad gave recently of the camera operator is panning too quickly. That's a problem that none of the current metrics can handle. And so it means that all of these other sort of metrics have this giant hole in operation that they say, well, if there's any problem in the original recording, then my predictions are all going to be invalid. And curiously, this is also kind of a gap in our development of video quality compression metrics. MPEG is using the same presumption. They do all their training, analysis, and judging of these algorithms given high quality originals. So we would like to fix that by creating a no reference metric that analyzes only the pixels as they're displayed to a monitor. And by doing this, we should be able to understand and assess camera capture impairments. The disadvantage is that this is an extremely difficult problem, which is why you're not seeing those solutions available today. There are a few products out there and, um, you know, I'm happy to see them out there, but it's, it's a challenge. And generally the performance feedback I've heard from the industry is fairly disappointed. So this is looking at seven freely available metrics that look at analyzing the quality of images or videos. And so these are all ones that are developed by researchers. That's the BRISC, IL, and IQE, and IQE, and so on along the right. The, I'm displaying those, the y-axis is Pearson correlation. So for everyone in the audience who's not heard of Pearson correlation, zero means it's a totally random response between the metric and what a person would say, the mean opinion scores from subjective test. One means it's absolutely perfectly matched. They give completely the same answer. Now we don't expect to ever see a one because there's some random differences among sets of subjects. That's not a realistic goal, but anything above around 0.85 Pearson correlation means the metric is performing equivalently to a subjective test, okay? So the meaning group, that the metric is as good as a person, as a, yeah. as a group of humans statistically would be. Correct. Okay. The claim is anything above that red dash line is as good as a person. So the blue line is what the authors reported was the performance of their metric on the limited scope of video or images that they developed and tested on. And pretty good. See, they all claim excellent performance as pretty good as good. a person. The problem is I then tested these algorithms on other sets of videos and images that had a broader scope. So these were metrics trained with no camera impairments. I then ran them on different camera impairments. So the orange bar is camera impairments, still images. The yellow bar is simulated adaptive, um, adaptive streaming. And the purple bar is uh, simulated broadcast problems. So these were high quality originals, no camera impairments, but compression artifacts. And you can see the performance has plummeted. So at below 0.5, there's really no value to this metric. And I really wouldn't personally trust anything below 0.75. So you see all of these metrics went, no reference metrics, when you took them for their intended application to something this audience is interested in, they all completely fell apart. So why is this happening? The first problem we're seeing is inappropriate training data. So these researchers were training on a limited scope of images or videos that just aren't of interest to broadcasters. A second problem is some of the vendors make available proprietary algorithms, and I'm told by industry that they aren't willing to trust these proprietary algorithms. They want to understand what's going on inside. The third problem is a little more subtle. These metrics are predicting the overall quality, the mean opinion score, and most of the realistic broadcast applications. In addition to overall quality, you need to know why is the quality bad so you can fix it. It's not good enough to just say it's bad. You want to know something like, 
it was interlaced when it should be progressive, it's too blurry, the camera's moving too quickly, whatever. You want a specific problem, you can go out and fix. And these algorithms aren't doing that. The next problem is we have a lot of ephemeral researchers. So think PhD students. They work on the problem with great enthusiasm for a very short period of time, and then they're gone. And if we're lucky, they publish the results, but maybe they didn't capture all the details. And the reason it's hard to be an ephemeral researcher is they don't have the research tools to kickstart their research and really dive into the problems. And so they're spending a lot of time working on just how to tackle the problem. And that includes they don't have a good research paradigm saying, here's how you should structure your research. So these are the areas that I've been focusing on solving. Let's look at the metric specifications we've come up with. Everything from discussions with industry indicates you want to take action. So it's not good enough to have this estimated mean opinion score. You need to know how big of a difference in mean opinion scores means you should take an action. That's a confidence interval saying, oh, it, the difference is too small. It's not a meaningful difference. But more important, you need root cause analysis. You need to divide that mean opinion score up into specific impairments of interest. And in discussions at a video quality experts group meeting, we came up with this large list of impairments, about 20 spatial impairments and 10 temporal impairments on the right. And I know we're missing from this picture some impairments of interest to broadcasters that just didn't occur to us at the time. My point is though, that there's at least 30 different problems 30 different impairments that need to be identified to really get a good picture of what's the, all the possible problems with a video. The research paradigm that I've developed is this equation. It's my only equation in this presentation. I want a model that's based off of mean opinion scores. So it's on the scale of one to five, five being the best, but then each, um, each impairment has its own parameter to predict root cause analysis. Each of those parameters is given a weight and then subtracted off from five. The reason I want this weight is so that you can take this model and say, okay, you have a parameter developed that detects an impairment that I don't care about. So I just want to zero out that weight and totally ignore it in my overall quality estimate. Um, for instance, the video is intentionally dark. That was the artistic intent of the developer. We don't want to lower the quality for that. Where say in a consumer camera, the consumer would want to know about this. You trust your videographers to get the white blend, black balance correct. But the reason I want this paradigm is that it means we can split apart this problem into separate smaller efforts to detect specific impairments. And a person developing a metric for one impairment doesn't need to be communicating with any other researchers, they just need to focus on doing a good job of detecting that impairment. Next, I'm dividing and focusing first on camera capture and then on compression. And I know this is, sounds kind of backwards because for the most part, compression artifacts are much more of interest to broadcasters. The problem that I ran into is that until we can detect, analyze, and understand the camera capture problems, with this sort of no reference philosophy, it's just not possible to detect these compression artifacts. We keep getting fooled by the camera artifacts and aren't able to separate out those. I'm excluding from consideration temporal integration, like what's the five minute or one hour prediction of quality given changes over time. That can be studied separately. And I'm ignoring transmission errors where these network metrics really do a fine job of analyzing the impact of network errors, packet loss, jitter, and so on. So as a quick aside, if we take the mean opinion scores from two different test labs and plot them against each other, we're going to get a scatter plot something like this. So you see there's a fair amount of scatter around the red fit line. There may be also a shift and a scaling factor between these two labs. However, this data is going to give you the same conclusions for the two labs. So if one lab shows there's a significant difference between stimuli A and stimuli B, and that A is better than B, 
there is a less than 1% chance that the other lab will say there's a significant difference in the opposite direction, that is B is better than A. And more likely the odds of that happening are going to be around 0.17%. This is a very infrequent event. So this scatter is just showing uh, expected differences of opinion among subjects. So basically okay. you're saying if you get two, two groups of people in two different rooms and you show them the same stuff, Opinions will vary, but not st st statistically significantly. Exactly. As long as you do okay, a careful job conducting your test, people overall, all over the world, will say A is better than B, or I can't tell the difference between A and B. And two communities really concluding the opposite direction means so probably it means something's really different in the setup. Like yeah, I your test was, was broken somehow, right? You're not, yeah. you're not testing the same way. Yeah, we use different monitors and your monitor genuinely looks better or asked a different question than you did. So I've been developing a new reference metric called Sawatch. As a quick aside, I picked Sawatch because it's a range of mountains in the, in the Colorado Rocky Mountains that contains a large number of the tallest mountains in the Rocky Mountains. And my goal there is not to put out one metric, but a series of metrics that are improving over time. That, and I live in Colorado. So, so it's called Sawatch. It is available on GitHub. And the x-axis is showing the performance, the prediction of the Sawatch metric on the same one to five scale. The y-axis is showing the mean opinion score from a subjective test. And each one of these 12 scatter plots is a different subjective test. The blue dots are the current subjective test. And to give you context, the green dots in the background show all of the subjective tests combined. The red line is the fit for just the blue dots that is the current subjective test. Now the first five data sets, BID, CCRIQ, et cetera, those are all image quality data sets that are looking just at camera impairments. So for instance, the second data set, CCRIQ, I worked with Intel. We took 23 cameras and photographed a variety of different scenes with the same cameras. And we were picking um, scenes that we thought would challenge the cameras in different ways, like landscapes and night scenes, for example. And we can see that the metric works pretty well on the CCRIQ data set, 0.7 Pearson correlation. Then the next three data sets are video data sets, again, with only camera impairments. And Margaret, I'm gonna just st stop you for a quick que uh, question here. So basically, if you go back a slide, here we've got group of humans on the x-axis, group of humans on the y-axis. Now, if you go forward a slide, we've got group of humans on the y-axis and a test on the on the x-axis. Is that right? And so we would, if the algorithm is working well, we would expect to see some scatter, but we'd expect to see that same sort of uh, correlation between what the humans think is is a particular measure and what the algorithm would think. Have I got that right? That's correct. Okay, so, got it. thank you. Yes, yeah, so the tight spread that we're seeing around the CID 2013 data set, thir top row third from the left, that's the sort of spread that's approaching what two sets of subjects would have. And so we're seeing this no reference metric is doing a fairly good job. At, for that data set, this metric is performing similarly to one person analyzing the video uh, as you could realistically do in real time. Now, if we look at, say, the live wild data set, that's second row, second from the left, okay, this scatter plot is looking much worse. I'm not happy with that. This is much worse than a single person would do. The likelihood of false ranking is very high and the spread there is pretty bad looking. The last three data sets are looking only at compression errors. So high quality original scenes, no camera problems. This is not the area I've been focusing on. Now the scatter plots are looking pretty terrible. Especially so the equivalent the here is you're using a screwdriver to cut wire 
I mean, <laughs> basically the wrong tool, and you see that in the in the plots yeah. that your your algorithms are not catching the the issues because that's not what they're looking for, right? That's it exactly. But this is to show where I am right now and where I'd like to be. We'd like to get to the point that those last three data sets have a tight cluster like you see in SID 2013. And at that point, this metric could really analyze both camera artifacts and compression errors. And so, so what we have, I'm currently up to version two of the SAWATCH metric, and I created this one to five star scale to be a just a quick look at how accurate this metric is and the parameters that it's built of. So at one star, very inaccurate, fairly worthless. Two stars, it's promising results. Three stars, consistent performance over 10 or more data sets. At four stars, I can say it's equivalent to a one person ad hoc test. So we really could- What does that mean, numbers. Margaret, one person ad hoc test? So, I mean, you're not doing all the structure of a subjective test. It's a single engineer sitting in front of their television saying, I like this better, I'm gonna tweak the knobs. No, that's worse. So that's any of you sitting in front of your television, that's a one person ad hoc test. Okay, got at, it. at a six person ad hoc test, I give it five stars. So you have the structure of a subjective test. You have six people, they're all actually writing down scores. You're not just saying, yeah, I like this better, but doing some amount of rigor following ITU recommendations on how to do a subjective test. So that's the ultimate goal. At that point, we can really say, wow, this sort of a metric really works well. My metric, I give a three stars. Consistent performance across multiple data sets, particularly if you limit yourself to camera impairments only. And it's built of nine parameters that analyze the root cause of nine different possible impairments. But remember, our quick brainstorming earlier indicated at least 30 impairments. So we know that not only are these parameters not as good as we'd like them to be, but we're totally ignoring 20 other, at least, impairments out there. So just to quickly go through the, the root cause analysis parameters I have currently, one detects blurring, one looks for a lack of fine detail, like you've downsampled and upsampled, all the fine detail is gone. White level problems and black level problems. Pan speed is looking at the pan is so fast that the quality is degraded. Color noise, a this is a little more interesting than the previous ones. So we know the YCBCR color space does not really reflect human perception of colors. So we expect to be seeing a lot of similarities between the CB and CR color planes. When we don't see those similarities, somebody did something artificial to the color planes or the camera had problems and did something wrong. And so we know there's a problem with the representation of color in the video or image. And that's what color noise is looking into. Most likely it's noise coming from inside the sensors that were capturing the image in the first place, but it could be some, you super exaggerate the color in one of those planes, but not the other, and it ends up looking kind of funny. Super saturation, that's colors are saturated beyond what we normally expect to see out of cameras. Pallid is the image or video is looking very uh, pale. There's just not a lot of color there and blockiness. And this is a fairly conservative measure of blockiness. The second thing I've done in addition to putting out the, this Sawatch metric is to put out all the tools that I've developed to do this line of research. It's all under open source licensing. There's a list of training data sets that are freely available to researchers that are suitable for this sort of metric development. There's structures and standard interfaces to help you understand and work with these data sets, develop your metrics and then apply them to the data sets. There's control software to be computing the metrics and analysis tools to look at their performance afterwards. And those analysis tools created the scatter plots that I showed you earlier. So all of these tools that a new researcher would need to get started are available on this and our metric framework, uh, GitHub repository. 
my future vision and goal is to develop Sawatch to the point that it can truly replace one person and be able to say, if the quality is low, why is the quality low? And no, we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. What we're missing mostly is videos that show broadcast impairments. So it's a lot easier for researchers in this line of study to get camera impairments because it's fairly cheap and easy to go out and buy a, a commercial camera. Um, it's harder to get broadcast quality footage that shows the sort of problems that broadcasters have and want to be able to detect that consumers may not even be aware of. And one example given to me was a flicker in the lighting because the camera refresh rate and the light refresh rate aren't working well. And so you see this flickering pattern in the background, especially on white walls. So consumers aren't gonna be noticing this but I, I understand it's something you care about. And I know there's other examples. So if you could contribute videos that show these specific impairments of interest to you with other researchers, this would be a great help. And please, if you're interested in this line of research, try my metric, give me feedback. I'd really appreciate that. And there's my email address if you'd like to reach out to me. Okay, great. So if people would like to give you some content that has particular problems with it that they would uh, like to have identified in some sort of machine automated way, they should get in touch with you, I guess, right? That's the content that you're having problems uh, getting a hold of? Yes. And I would say okay. the other problem is that um, you're wanting much higher quality pristine originals than it's easy for other researchers, including myself, to get a hold of. So there's some very high-end subtle impairments that no researcher is going to be able to detect until such videos are made available. Sure, makes sense. All right, wonderful. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for coming back and giving us a report out of, of where you are. Uh, I, I wish that our, our dear friend Pierre was here because I know he would be saying, uh, I have a question, I, you know, uh, but, uh, but Pierre has, has moved on to other things, so he's not here, but we, I, I really find this uh, fascinating, the idea, the whole issue uh, that you and Sean McCarthy and other people have talked about, about the human visual perception and trying to understand what's going on and then model that uh, in order to, to uh, have some sort of machine be able to basically evaluate um, the, the content that we produce in a way similar to what a human would do. It's not easy. So, um, and it's really fascinating to me. So my hats are, uh, my hats off to you and, and the people working on these sorts of things. And uh, thank you so much for coming to present. We really appreciate it. Thank you.